Hey, let's talk about politics. Once upon a time, I heard the quote, tell me who controls your media and I care not who your politicians are. So what does that mean? Let's try a thought experiment. Right now, if I told you that the president of the United States, the majority of the Supreme Court, the uh, Speaker of the House, we're all going to be from the same religion. And on top of that, on a city level, if I told you that the police chief, the, the city mayor, the, board, the majority of the board of supervisors, who else? If all of them were also from the same religion within, within the U.S., I'm trying to think if I've, if I've left anyone out. No, that's probably it. I said all those were in that position, and all of them were Jewish. Most people would suspect that there is, would have an issue with that, let's be honest. It would be the same thing if I said all those people were Muslim. Now, why is that? Part of that is because we've been conditioned to think certain things about certain religions and therefore about certain people through, of course, media representation. Now, it turns out, there probably isn't, you know, there probably is a situation where it may show that because the United States has a minority uh, within a democratic system that is in control of all those different offices on the national and the local level. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> the state governor was, would also be part of this, of the same religion and so on. It would, that kind of concentration it doesn't seem right, doesn't feel right to our intuition because it, it sort of tells you that the majority uh, is, is absent from the political scene, which pretty much never happens unless you have either, uh, there's probably a lot of reasons how it could happen, but all those reasons would indicate a problem. But it turns out that this is precisely the situation we're going to see ourselves in next year, except that probably, depending on the election results at the national level, we're going to see the same thing, except that instead of being Muslim or Jewish, we're going to be dealing with a Catholic situation of, a con of concentration of power. And yet, despite the many transgressions of the Catholic Church recently. We don't have to go back too far. This doesn't seem to mind, people don't seem to mind. That is a consequence of the media. That is a consequence of having the power to control, number one, just the absence of those facts that I just gave you. The fact that all those offices will soon be concentrated in the hands of a single religion. We would call that a theocracy. And in fact, we do. When we talk about other countries, like Iran, you say that's a theocracy. When we talk about a single one-party state, we talk about China. But in fact, in California, if you have the governor, the city mayor, the police, and so on, all under the same religion, well, that's also a one-party state. This is not a Catholic church. This is a Coptic church. So I believe it comes out of Egypt, potentially. But it's Coptic Orthodox, so I actually don't know. It says St. George, so there may be a Catholic connection here as well. Now, if I showed you, a, if I were able to get voters where in a situation where they would be shown images of Catholics molesting children. Um, what else? And this has actually happened before. Political cartoons will show it. Covering up child molestation, uh, making deals with Hitler to protect property, which did happen in Germany. What else? There's just so many. Um, money laundering. I mean, you could just go down a list. Um, Oh, supporting the war in Vietnam. 
installing a de facto dictator in South Vietnam called Diem and having his archbishop brother involved in government affairs, both of whom discriminated against the local Buddhists in South Vietnam so severely that one of them set, them, set himself on fire to protest as a protest against the, the US JFK funded invasion of South Vietnam and so on. So if I showed you all that and I put it on loop, you would have a problem with, with that kind of concentration of power. But because we're not seeing it, people don't have a problem with that concentration of power at all. They, they may want to reconsider it, but one of the problems is that even having that concentration of power will be acceptable to most voters if you show, instead of photos of what I just described, you show photos of Mother Teresa, you show photos of Catholic refugee agencies, which by the way, <laughs> evacuate people in part because the military acting under the support of the Catholic Church invades other countries, whether it's Cuba, whether it's Vietnam and the South. And if they fail, they basically take over and take back the people that supported them, that were involved in the uprising or potential or failed coup. And so in many cases, it's not something that's this refugee resettlement is an arm of the military seeking to expand its influence that then cleans up the mess if the attempted coup fails. Now, you can see right away that the reason that we don't have that level of concern, despite heading our way into a theocracy within the United States under the Catholic Church, is because the media is, is clearly failed. And you're gonna, when you, study, when you study the United States in the future, people are, are going to ask, what the hell happened? There was no competition after 1945. To the extent there was competition, it came from the Soviet Union, which collapsed in 1991. And, quite, and at that point, the United States was able to continue its, you could call it world economic domination, through controlling oil supplies, natural gas supplies, most recently in Iraq. And even the very internet technological infrastructure that made all the payments for all the sales of all those things possible in a so-called secure system, or as secure as it could possibly be. And people are gonna wonder what happened. And I'm, it's going to be very difficult to figure out because we still don't know exactly what happened in Germany in, in the 1930s. Well, we sort of do. The country was massively in debt because it lost, you know, World War I. The reparations it had to pay were grossly unfair and the German people rose up. But the fact of the matter is that we don't kill millions of Jewish people unless you have a somewhat open society that got them there in the first place. In other words, in order to complain about something, the society has to, something like that, like immigration, for example, society has to be somewhat open in order to get people to come and work and make a life in that country. So the very fact that there were so many Jewish people in Germany indicates that before Hitler, at a certain point in time, the country was open, it was liberal, and it had to have been open-minded. So what happened? And I suspect what happened, what happened was the same situation that happened in every other situation in the whole world, where the economy went down, people looked for something to blame, or people, or, or and that blame, of course, landed on the minority that had no political power. That's the definition of a minority, no, no majority political power. And that seems like a very simplistic analysis, but it's starting as an American looking at what happened in Germany, I have to start figuring out what's going on because you know, Germany, just like the United States, was number one in math and science. And of course that math and science leadership position also allows a lot of the economic security that we see here today 
um, not only because the U.S. Navy is able to transport oil and gas more securely, protect shipments from pirates, and based on that protection, have a banking system that is also secure, which is also underpinned by an insurance system, and so on and so forth. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, some people might look back and say that you know, the United States had excessive surveillance. Well, you know, so did East Germany, and yes, they collapsed as well, but uh, China has pretty good surveillance today. today. It's not doing badly. Some people, here we go. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but we're also under... Well, there's a cross on the building behind me, but it's too dark to see. So I suppose there's some diversity, but um, you can see that maybe there's just not enough. Maybe it's just sort of an offshoot of the same thing. Um, but it's concern, it's perturbing, right? Being a minority or, or an immigrant within this country and having studied history and realizing that essentially the Europeans offshored and transferred the Protestant Catholic divisions to where I'm standing right now. And most people, even in this country, don't realize what happened. But what happened was that the Catholics kicked out the Protestants and you know, <laughs> that created the backlash and then the French came in and kicked out the Catholics. And along the way, Spanish, Spain, you know, Spanish Catholic Spain went to the South, New Orleans, created an economy based on slave labor, especially because the fields in the South were suitable for tobacco and cotton. And the people in the North, where it was much colder, the Protestants went up there. It was not, the North was not colonized by Catholic Spain. The North was in many ways Anglican, which is a reformed Catholic church, which was reformed because England became, well, England essentially became a form of uh, Protestantism, you know, protesting the Catholic Church. And so you look at all this and you see why the Civil War happens, right? You have two different religions, two different economies, and everyone knew what they were doing was wrong. Thomas Jefferson has a letter, a famous one that I've mentioned before. And of course, at one point, at some point it all came to a head. But you know, you're looking here today, the economy is fairly integrated. There isn't this sort of division between North and South. I'm here basically at an outdoor mall. There's a Chinese restaurant across the street. This is something that you could easily, I could easily be in a city in the South, like Nashville, for example. I mean, you could argue that perhaps the, the population is not spread out sufficiently and under the system of government, uh, smaller groups are able to control, have excessive power. And that's just that's more problematic than, than anticipated. If cities of only, you know, 100,000 people in Montana are able to send the same powerful representatives, or sorry, senators uh, to Congress as a state with, you know, tens of millions of people like California. But that still wouldn't explain what we're doing here and why the country is having so many issues. And this is what I sort of wonder is what will people, what will the obituary of the United States look like? And who's going to write it? Because all these things are going to be covered in the obituary and one of them is going to, is going to be military spending, but that's, that's not something that's unique to any empire. Most empires on the way down either make a crucial mistake, so Hitler decides to invade Russia, uh, <laughs> The Soviet Union decides to invade Afghan Afghanistan. And then the Afghan people that were funded by the United States decide to attack the United States and New York. So there's some connection there, but still not enough to really give you any kind of answer. And, and it's possible that the country is just too damn big for there to be one obituary. It may be that you're gonna need, you know, six or seven obituaries to figure out what happened here. Because overextension from the military perspective is probably not the answer. Although, 
half the country at this point lacks sufficient financial means to survive without a government bailout that's going on right now. The government has sent $1,200 to each American adult. We'll send most likely another $1,200 to each American adult at some point in the future. And has even waived, uh, to put a moratorium on evictions without which about 25% of the renting population would be homeless. That's not, <laughs> and such a population is not insignificant because it's just have how expensive housing has become. In this neighborhood, which is nothing special, uh, you know, you, you have to spend about $2,000 a month just to get a small room. And you most likely have to share that. If you go an hour north of here, uh, you probably have to create a situation where you have four or five roommates and you're still paying about the same amount. So I'm very concerned that people are going to blame diversity. They're going to say, well, what really happened here was, was diversity. People were too liberal. They were too open. And that's what makes me really sad because as somebody who's an immigrant, I'm also a part of the social fabric. And I probably understand the social fabric better than anyone who is native born within this country, partly because I studied law and I've had work jobs all over the country and so on. Um, and you may be able to argue the problem has included lawyers. And after the uh, 2001 attack, the lawyers simply receded into power, uh, just decided not to, well, no, we're not able to really do much. Um, we see some of that today with the immigration situation where lawyers are not able to do much. But it's something else we have to discover or talk about is the fact that it can't necessarily be Catholicism, it can't necessarily be this Catholic Protestant divide, simply because the fact of the matter is that the British Empire was just as bad as any other empire. It was responsible for starving people in, in the Bengal region in India. It essentially caused a famine. Uh, the, I think it was the British East India Company controlled the military. They began taxing people overseas. You know, it wasn't just the, the Spanish Catholics that decided to head over and steal Mexico's gold and silver and take it back to the queen in Spain. So, I suppose if you're looking for commonalities, it becomes more and more difficult to find them other than having a military that is that lacks morals. And the question is, as I've discussed before, you know, when you defeat an enemy, in many cases you become the enemy. And not just because you have to infiltrate that society, but simply because, you know, you can see the patterns here. You know, East Germany was accused of spying on their own people. We now have, after Edward Snowden's revelations, we know that we're doing the ex exact same thing that, that East Germany was doing. With the attack in 2001, we know that the legal safeguards on those, on that surveillance, essentially went away. There were, and there were very few protests. Um, I believe a FISA court judge, FISA, resigned. But these programs continued. So the question is, are we going to be able to find in this obituary of the United States, are we going to be able to find a single cause? And I doubt it. I don't think it's going to happen. So what do we, what do we tell future generations about what happens here? Because if we don't tell the story, someone else might come in and say it had to have been, you know, diversity, it had to have been the immigrants. Look what happened when Donald Trump came to office. He deported so many immigrants who were, who were in the country illegally and so on. But I'm telling you, that's simply not the case. You can go outside right now and you see that it's a very stable society. So we may be able, able to get somewhere simply by discussing, number one, maybe we can say at the top of the chain, at the top of the chart, you can say that, well, one of, one of the criterion, one of the criteria would be just the fact that you, you have a, a military that either overreaches, overextends itself, and is immoral. 
behaves in a way that's immoral and then justifies it through some sort of racism, some sort of deflection that allows them to continue the immorality because it is economically profitable. That's certainly what happened with slaves in this country, with some people that were preternaturally intelligent. So we might be able to put that criteria, criteria on somewhere at the top of the list. Still not enough. Still doesn't really tell you what, what happened here because I mean, everything here is stable. So one of the other things you might want to think about is just the fact that things are, are in fact stable, but, but not really. In other words, we are now living in a time of unprecedented debt. This building may be stable, the neighborhood may be safe, but the fact of the matter is you're going to see a lot of new cars in, in the parking lots here. Not now, but in the afternoon, I saw quite a few of them at the local shopping mall. They look shiny, they look new, the evidence of success and financial stability. But if you actually look under, under the hood, you're going to see that in fact, the, the cars have debt. The people that own those cars that are brand new are in debt to a bank. They don't actually own the cars. And so this evidence of prosperity is actually anything but, because the car is a depreciating asset. So maybe what you can see here in this parking lot with a couple of cars behind me, maybe, maybe one of the problems is a lack of public transportation. Although as Germany was able to efficiently move people around, probably because it had very good public transportation back in the day, Soviet Union still has public transportation that works today, 40, you know, 30 years later, 40 years later. So <laughs> you can see that it's very difficult when you're in the middle of an empire in decline to figure out what's going on. But you know, you know something's wrong. But there's nothing that actually tells you anything is wrong. Now, is it possible that all the dissenting voices are in jail? That's possible. United States jails is probably at least in the top 10 when it comes to jailing its own citizens, even apart from any sort of illegal immigration housing or temporary jails. And like I said, look, even in, in the middle of a trillion dollar bailout, the country is so prosperous that it's building new roads. So once again, despite having two trillion dollar bailouts in 15 years, if you were to come here, you wouldn't think there would be a problem. Everything is quite stable. It sort of has to be here with respect to the physical infrastructure because we are in an earthquake area. We are on a fault line or at least nearby one. So the question again is, what are we going to leave behind? What are we going to tell future generations about what happened? Because the media and the education system and so on are in part dominant, you know, sort of dominated by the Catholic Church, it's going to be more difficult for people to go back and say, well, it was the Catholics. And this is a pattern of intolerance that goes all the way back to the Crusades. That will be a very convenient answer. Wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> but it wouldn't, it would still be a little, it's still a bit convenient. It's not gonna help anybody else. And the fact of the matter is, this city is prosperous. It's stable and it's safe. Otherwise I couldn't be walking here at night. So we try to come to a search for answers. And I'm afraid we're not gonna find any. And that's what I think bothers me the most. Because what it means is that the next person that tries the same thing is has the exact same risks of falling apart in such a short period of time. And that seems to somebody that now understands much more history than he ever thought he would, that seems unacceptable. To have all this knowledge and to know that 
there's not a whole lot you can leave to future generations that will help them in any, in any way avoid the same fate. You know, it's somebody will come back and say, well, there's a lot of cars, people were in debt for a depreciating item, there were housing was too expensive. All this debt caused people to be people to be stretched out. That stress then manifested itself in many other ways and so on and so forth. And, you know, if they had only built better public transportation, but again, the fact of the matter is that <laughs> well, there was some public transportation, uh, but that's not something that, you know, it's not something that certainly didn't prevent Europe from having some issues, even though Europe is much more walkable. This building here uh, used to be a, a church of some sort. And once again, we go back to that sort of simple answer. Maybe it was Christianity all along. That's probably not, that's probably not the answer. So I'm trying to come up with an answer. And I'm not quite sure if we're ever going to get one. Debt seems to come up quite a bit in the analysis, whether it's on a government level or an, or an individual level, simply because people don't like working <laughs> to pay off a bank or a foreign creditor. It seems there's a bit of unfairness involved. But the United States, the one thing that you can say that the United States has succeeded in has been the banking sector. The United States now has the strongest banking sector in the entire world, which is exactly why it can issue trillions of dollars against its own balance sheet, and it can pay its citizens $1,200 within a month after an act of Congress. So maybe the problem is the banking system was too strong, people had too much money, or they had access to too much money, and the country became too rich too quickly. And all this stability, all this physical, physical infrastructure is a chimera. It just masks the fact that most of this is really debt soaked and is not actually stable. The foundations may look stable, but they're not because all of this is based on debt. The developers of the shopping mall that I went to probably have at least a billion dollars in debt. A substantial amount of money. The cars that we see as a percentage of income put a lot of stress on the individual citizen's balance sheet. And so perhaps this stability that we're looking at now is just misleading. But it's still quite difficult to say, even if you're able to come up with many, many reasons the excessive number of people in jail, the excessive amount of debt, the excessive military spending, the lack of morality in terms of the military's expansion overseas since Vietnam. You combine that with a consolidated government under one religion, suddenly it doesn't look so diverse after all. And yet, because the United States is doing, still doing better than many other countries on, on a relative basis, it's not going to want for aspiring citizens. So some people might go back and say, listen, it was the immigration all along. People wanted to come here so badly. You had a split between the formal sector of the economy and the informal sector of the economy. And I'm not sure that's, that's true either. A lot of the people that came here in search of um, trying to leverage the, high, the stronger currency of the US dollar in order to send back money home, a lot of those people are basically invisible. Uh, they work in the back of a restaurant, they work in places that we don't see. When I went to Texas and I was near, it was in Houston, Texas, a very big city in America. And I don't think I saw, the only Latinos I saw 
um, or in one restaurant. And Texas is supposed to be, there's a joke that Texas should be called Tejas, sort of in, in a Spanish accent, simply because it is becoming more and more Latino. But in fact, a statement that was made on a TV show about immigration that maybe could shed some light, you know, just segregation. Uh, one of the Latinos that was, was, was applying for asylum, sorry, for a pardon, in order to become a legal resident, was driving around as part of this documentary and was saying that, you know, I'm Latino, but, you know, I live with white people. I try, you know, I try to blend in. That's why I have, probably why I haven't been caught. My people, Latinos, they all hang out in the same neighborhood. That makes them a very easy target for law enforcement when they want to do immigration raids. So I think that perhaps that's the problem. And when we talked about public transportation, what, we're really, what I was really attempting to describe was the difficulty in trying to, make, to reach across borders, invisible ones, within your, within your own city. And there are many invisible borders when it comes to funding, especially when you have multiple layers of government, in terms of schools, in terms of community centers, and especially because cities and states have to balance their budgets, which essentially means they have to borrow money. Now, <laughs> and that may be the answer, at least a big one, after the other one, the other one we just talked about, which is an immoral military plus overexpansion. Because it's not just physical borders or fronteras that concern people and that limit their movements. It's this idea that you have this, this universal financial currency that goes across borders and in fact makes the country stronger, if not the strongest country in the world, because it is a borderless currency. At the same time that the country enforces borders as strictly as possible, as it possibly can, given the size of its borders. So you have a lot of contradictions, perhaps. And if you make it more and more difficult for, if you make it too easy for people to segregate themselves, what ends up happening is probably an easier environment for scapegoating, regardless of the person's religion, race, or whatever characteristic that people have focused on in the past. And because you have all these invisible barriers or borders that make it hard to go from one place to the next in your own city, that could be the answer. Today I spent $17 uh, filling up half a tank of gas on my small car. You notice most cars are not that small. I've got a truck behind me, another truck right over here, and for a small car that I have, $18 is, is quite a bit of money, about two hours of work for most people after taxes, and that's just to get from point A to point B. So you can argue that this cost, you know, all these different layers that make it harder to, to just move across borders, in both physical, both visible and, and invisible within your own city, you could argue that the invisible ones, including financial barriers, you can argue that these together combine to create a society that can easily scapegoat somebody, somewhere, and in doing so, make it harder to focus on fundamental reform. That might be the answer. It's something I've talked about before as well. And I think it maybe it makes, makes it's starting to make more sense. Because when I was younger, in my 20s, you know, I wouldn't, I would really only go to work and come back, or I would go to school and come back. And I probably traveled the same 25 miles of asphalt most of the time uh, for about, let's say, 
for about 10 years, I would say. I mean, obviously I went out of the country. But aside from the time that I was able to go out of the country, when I was in this country, I pretty much only traveled a small area because I didn't have that much money. And I had debt. I had student loans. Not, in other words, it was, it, was in, it was not something I could avoid. We have another church over here behind me, San Jose Korean Central Church. One of the reasons why, and again, it's really, it's gonna be really tempting to, to say that it was Christianity. Because <laughs> you're not seeing any synagogues and mosques over here. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's the reason you have this is because it's, it's a tax break. Um, you know, this building over here, you know, um, so that's the church. There's another building right behind me very, very well built. It's a business. The building over there does not pay taxes, but pays fewer taxes than the building over here. It's a commercial enterprise. And so if you are looking to buy land, you want to create a situation where you try to have as many loopholes as you possibly can so that you can put together some sort of influence and then use that influence to maybe try to transfer it into a media blitz of some sort um, or something else that would gain, that would make it more difficult to scapegoat you or to put you in a ghetto of some sort um, or to claim that you're not contributing something to the, to the economy or to the society itself. So you have not only, you know, within, we talked about borders, we talked about segregation. There is financial segregation across the same street. Two buildings may have even been built by the same contractor. In other words, the church over there was probably a building before that, an office building, and then it was converted into a church when it was bought. But you still have some form of segregation. In other words, you can look at, if you look at segregation as a form of fragmentation, you can maybe try to it may be a little bit easier to see that the cause isn't just difficulty traveling within your own country, difficulty with having an excessive number of even invisible borders within your own city. I've only walked about a mile and a half, I think. And we're looking at all these kinds of borders. So you can see, number one, why, why oil and gas has been so crucial. You can see how it limits if you have to pay a lot of your income towards simply getting from point A to point B. You can see why it limits your entire life, but more to the point, it limits the opportunities to connect. And especially, if, well, I think I saw a spider web there. Especially if you're now in a more diverse society. Well, there you go. Now you've got more languages You've got more customs that you don't understand right off the bat. So it's even more crucial to connect across these invisible borders and across all these fragmented econo uh, economic systems with taxation and so on. There's a 0% chance I'm gonna be able to go to that church, even though we just passed it. I don't know anybody in the church. It would be very odd for me to show up since I'm not Korean. You multiply that situation by 10,000, you can see why, <laughs> why food and why people like Anthony Bourdain were so popular because they were able to create a situation where they brought people together. They, they, man they managed to not eliminate these borders, but they managed to make them smaller. So that might be the answer. At the same time, you have more diversity. The borders and fragmentation multiply if the costs increase at the same time, you have, you have more and more complexity within your own society, as well as an increased number of invisible borders. You have a society that makes it much easier to scapegoat. And then inevitably, inevitably what happens in every other empire happens again where the minority becomes targeted as a result of segregation or 
get, being ghetto-sized due to a lack of investment because of the lack of political power that minorities inherently have. I think that might be it. I think we we might have gotten there. We might have we might have written page one of an obituary because 40 minutes of a lot of meandering comments, but I think we we're on page one. We finished a rough draft of page one of not only the obituary of the United States, but the obituary of every other empire in the history of the world. Segregation, difficulty of connect in connecting as societies borders multiply both economically and physically. Then just more complexity that then causes people to rely on visual issues that in many cases is, is misleading. Simply having a lot of like fancy cars doesn't mean the country is rich. It may mean the exact opposite. Having a lot of nice buildings may mean the exact same thing. It may simply mean that the contractor or the real estate developer is over leveraged. And, the, and because you have so many different financial systems, it becomes more and more difficult, even if you have the same accounting standard, to try to figure out what's going on as all these borders and the difficulty of reaching across them, even within one city, multiplies. And in order to promote simplicity and to promote human connection, which is what all of us seek at the an understanding, people then revert to simplicity. And then oftentimes simplicity means dialing back a lot of the progress that's been made. Or perhaps it makes it easier for the military to continue doing something immoral in order to maintain its own legitimacy, whether overseas or within the country. I think we've got, we've got to start. We've got to start. And part of the answer is in fact public transportation that's affordable, but also giving people the reason, a reason to travel outside of their normal 25 mile environment. I think, I think we've got somewhere.